Hello, Mr. Buffett, Mr. Munger. Uh, my name is Grant Gibson. I'm from Denver, Colorado, and this is my fifth consecutive year here, so thank you for having us. Thanks for uh, coming. <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, with all due respect, Mr. Buffett, this question is for Mr. Munger. Uh, in your career of thousands of negotiations and business dealings, could you describe for the crowd which one sticks out in your mind as your favorite or as otherwise noteworthy? Well, I don't think I've got a favorite, but the one that probably did us the most good as a learning experience was Seeds Candy. It just, the power of the brand, uh, the unending flow of ever-increasing money with no work. Yeah. Sounds nice. It, it, uh, <laughs> it was, and I'm not sure we would have bought the Coca-Cola if we hadn't bought the Seas. I think that a life properly lived is a, it's just learn, learn, learn all the time. And I think Berkshire's gained enormously from these investment decisions by learning through a long, long period. Every time you appoint a new person that's never had big capital allocation experience, it's like rolling the dice. And I think we're, we're way better off having done it so long. And, and, but the decisions blend. And the one feature that comes through is the continuous learning. If we had not kept learning, you wouldn't even be here. You'd be alive, probably, but not here. <laughs> There's nothing like the pain of being in a lousy business to make you appreciate a good one. <laughs> well, there's nothing like getting into a really good one. That's a very pleasant experience, and it's a learning experience. I have a friend who says, the first rule of fishing is to fish where the fish are, and the second rule of fishing is to never forget the first rule. And, and we've gotten good at fishing where the fish are. Yeah, that's only metaphorically. I went, to, I went to fish with Charlie there, one there time. There are too many other fish. boats in the damn water, but, <laughs> but the fish are still there. <laughs> yeah, we, we bought a department store in Baltimore in 1966, and there's really nothing like being in the experience of trying to decide whether you're going to put a, a new store in a area that hasn't really developed yet enough to support it, but your competitor may move there first, and then you have the decision of whether to jump in, and if you jump in, that kind of spoils, and now you've got two stores where even one store isn't quite justified. Uh, how to play those games, those business games, uh, is you, you learn a lot by trying, and, and what you really learn is which ones to avoid. I mean, if, if you just stay out of a bunch of terrible businesses, <laughs> you're off to a very great start, as far because we've, we've tried them all. But you can really learn because the experience is a lot like eating cockle burgers, and it really gets your attention. Got a lot of cash, and we know how to behave well in a panic. Uh, and if the world doesn't go to hell, are things so bad now? <laughs> and I also want to report that your vice chairman is getting new social distinction. I've been invited during this gathering to go to a happy hour put on by the Bitcoin people. <laughs> and I've tried to figure out what the Bitcoin people do in their happy hour, and I finally figured it out. They celebrate the life and work of Judas Iscariot. <laughs> Is your invitation still good? <laughs> Similar to the question before on what advice you would give to young individuals with a passion for business and finance, what would you say is the best possible way for someone to expose themselves and expand their understanding of working in the business world which, without actually currently being involved in it? And how can I maximize um, my potential value to a corporation in the future by what I do right now? Well, that's a, a good question. And there's so many of you now who want to be rich by going into finance. And of course, that and multitude is not going to all get rich. And, and of course, 99% will be in the bottom 
That's just the way it's going to work. If I look at the people in my generation who were the nerds who were patient and rational eventually did well, who lived within their income and, and worked at being sensible and, and when they saw an opportunity, grabbed it pretty fiercely and so forth. And I think that'll work for the new nerds of the world. And the people who get ahead because they're star salesmen or charismatic personalities, I'm not one of those, so I don't know how to do that. So if you're not a nerd, I can't help you. And, and I think that the odds are that most people who try to do finance are not going to succeed. And, and there's a lot of wretched excess in it because easy money will always attract wretched excess. It's just the nature. It's like a bunch of animals feeding on a carcass in Africa. By the way, that's an image I chose on purpose. And, but no, so I don't think it's so pretty. And I don't think that modern finance is so wonderful. And in my day, a lot of the finance people were more like engineers. They were so chastened by the Great Depression and all the wretched failure that they really tried to make everything super safe. And it was a very different plodding place that just tried, the people weren't trying to get rich, they were trying to be safe. This modern world is radically different. And, and I'm not sure if I were starting out in your world, in your world, how well I would do. It would be a lot harder than it was to get ahead in the world the way it was when I came up. How were you? My best advance, I think you'll be happier if you reduce your expectations than if you try and satisfy them. And by the way, I think that's generally a very good idea. It sounds silly, but it's so obvious. You know how many of us are fairly content with pretty moderate success? That is worth knowing, because that's what most of us are going to get.